Okay. All right, everybody can see the screen, right? Fabulous, I got some head nods. Okay, good. Yep. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, I, we already are like starting good conversation and chat, some, some stuff in the chat, but please don't make me talk through the whole hour here. I'm gonna naturally pause um, in between each module, but use the chat function, unmute yourselves, like um, throw in some questions there. And then at the end, we're also gonna do a Q&A. So if we don't get to your question or whatever, we can hit it at the end. Um, but yeah, so just to start, really, really appreciate everybody spending an hour first thing in the morning with me. We're all, we're just saying in different time zones. So I genuinely appreciate you all being there. And I was saying to Karen earlier, but if you have to jump off, totally fine. Um, I'm gonna record, I'm recording it now. and. I'll download the presentation and all my uh, material that I reference and send that to everybody, probably just everybody on the, the email list, not just everybody who comes obviously to the meeting itself. Um, but it's so it's so great to see everybody. I feel like we've all gotten to work together and I've met maybe most of you at this point, but um, it's nice to like put everybody in a room and I don't know, collectively like go through this together. So I have learned so much with my eight years being at SVP and this whole session is based on 16 years of our partners, Toyota, UPS, farmers, um, and just experience learning things the hard way through client services. Um, so it's it's like a it's a just collective uh, experience that we've all had. But even that said, you've all had very different, unique experiences than we've had, and so I really value your feedback. So even after the session. You, you all know how to reach me, but email me, text, call, whatever. I love feedback. Um, if you had a different experience with something, if um, you think I missed something, which is possible, um, let me know. So yeah, just wanted to, to put that out there also. Um, so I don't know how relevant all of this is gonna be to everybody. You all really do things a little bit differently and you're all kind of in your own niche, um, obviously regions, but markets too. And so, you know, some of it might be irrelevant, but just bear with me. I think that overall it's going to, it's maybe going to be helpful. And if not, you can just ignore that part. Um, okay, so let me go to the next slide, jump into it here. So, okay, so for those of you who know me, this will be maybe repetitive or maybe not, because I haven't really gone into how I got here, but I think it's relevant. Um, so I'm from New York, obviously, if you haven't heard that already. Um, I got involved in Hurricane Sandy. I was actually abroad during Sandy um, and saw it hitting literally my neighborhoods where I lived and grew up, couldn't do anything about it. And so when I got back, um, which was months after Sandy, I just wanted to volunteer. And so I got, um, got hooked up through AmeriCorps with what was called the St. Bernard Project at the time. Um, back in Rockaway, Queens. And this was, even then it was like eight months after Sandy, maybe even a year after Sandy. Um, and what I saw was amazing. I mean, I thought a year after Sandy, this stuff's gonna be re rebuilt mostly. Um, and it wasn't, it was basically the same um, that it, it looked like, you know, six months even after Sandy, it hadn't been rebuilt at all. Um, and so I did work with AmeriCorps for a year and then stayed on with SVP in New York for the next seven years. Um, and, but what really sticks with me is this, is this is my community. It was my neighborhood. And I know that you all in your respective communities are doing it for, we all do it for different reasons and it's hard work that's usually very thankless. Um, but it doesn't so much matter, I think, where we all are but that we're all really doing it for the same purpose and the same reason. Um, and so I just say that to say geography matters in how we do it, but it, it doesn't so much matter in why we do it. Um, and so this family here is the Benix. This is Rich. He is a 9-11 FDNY first responder. He is now retired. Uh, his wife, Linda, their daughter, Ashley, who's a crossing guard and their granddaughter, Ashley, um, who's in her master's for criminal justice right now. Actually, she might be done now, but she was. And their dog, dachshund dog, Sammy. I'm a huge dog fan. This dog hated me and tried to bite me twice. Whatever, I don't take it personally. But um, th this picture was only taken about a year ago. And the siding that is behind them is a result of 
just driving rain and wind over the course of, at that point, eight years, um, just being like, you know, beaten down from wind and rain in Brooklyn. So that's a family in Brooklyn. A year ago, I took that picture. And then on the inside, what all of that driving rain from the roof and the siding did was obviously deteriorate the inside of the house. I know you've all seen pictures and been in houses just like this, but they put up this like plastic tablecloth that you can kind of see to try to just not look at it every day. Um, and this is eight years after Sandy. This is totally not what it should be. And I, I do these um, trainings and I, I'm so happy to be able to be in a position to share this and work with you all because I really don't want you and your respective communities to have this, have a Benick family eight years after Sandy. I shouldn't have had to, to like walk into their house and see this and they shouldn't be living with this. Um, at the end, I'll tell you like kind of how everything came together and what we ended up being able to do for them. But in October, this is past October, they became the last Hurricane Sandy family that we repaired uh, their home. So they, they have a good ending to the story, but it took them exactly nine years to get to this point. Um, and I use them also as an example, other than they were a fantastic family and I was very honored to serve them um, because they had applied actually in 2018 and they were scared away by our, um, by not understanding the difference between us and any other nonprofit. Lots of other nonprofits, lots of other companies, insur insurance agencies, everybody had come in and I guess like over promised or over committed and then not done anything. And when they got our application and we walked them through it, because I remember in 2018 doing that with them, um, they got scared and they didn't trust us. And so they, they left and became unresponsive. Um, and that's a failing on us that we didn't explain it properly. We didn't, you know, set expectations and you know, show who we were in 2018. And it took another two years for Rich's good friend who had elevated his home to say, Rich, you need to reach out to them. Like these people are for real. Um, and then he called us again and we went through everything, but he could have been served in 2018. And so kind of like brings it all back to why client services is so important. Um, but our approach then I think wasn't the best approach for him and his family and it caused him to wait three more years to get this all repaired. So with that, I will go into a little bit more about SVP. I think probably most of you know the story of SVP and I know Olivia knows the story, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, so we got started in 2006 in the St. Bernard Parish, which is actually where our name originated from. Um, that was right after Katrina and all of those flyover shots. And I, I, I'm worried even saying all of this because I know there are people here who experienced Katrina or experienced the aftermath of Katrina, obviously more and know more about this than I do. So I'm a little hesitant to even go into this, but I'll, I'll say what I, what I know. Um, so those flyover shots from um, Katrina where the houses are just like roof level and then water, that's the St. Bernard Parish. And so that's where we got started um, in 2006. What we found from there when Zach and Liz, who are our CEO and uh, COO, our co-founders, went down there a year after Katrina was that lots of good people there, lots of money, lots of volunteers, but nothing really getting rebuilt, nothing getting done. Um, and so they just slowly started rebuilding. Originally, um, <clears throat> they were able to rebuild about 106 homes, 116 homes, um, sorry, a home every 116 days. Um, and they were thinking that the more money, the more volunteers, the more resources we get, the faster we'll be able to rebuild homes. And that was not the case, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So eventually they were lucky enough to partner with Toyota um, and Toyota helped them kind of shrink that time to down to about 60 days per home. So after you fast forward from that, there were the Joplin, Missouri tornado uh, in 2011, May of 2011. And that was the first time we realized, hey, our model here of rebuilding, oh, on average, like 60 days with just like single family homes, one, I think it was like uh, one bedroom, one bathroom, average size, um, could work in your community. And so that's when we started branching out into SHARE, which is how we're all here. <clears throat> and SHARE 
is the embodiment of a yoga, yoga ten, which means if you do it well, share it. And I'll kind of get into the whole Toyota production system stuff in a minute, but um, that's how we realized, you know, we can't rebuild every house after a disaster. It's going to take a community, a village to do all of this. How do we support all of our peers um, through money, through training, through sharing what we've learned um, to make everybody stronger and more efficient for survivors? And then, of course, there's preparedness. It's more than a go bag. I don't have to tell you all what the importance of preparedness is. So we have a preparedness department. I don't so much get involved in that, but there is somebody who works with that. Um, and then there's advise, which is our city and state like elected official advocacy and kind of training where we'll go in and talk to them after um, disasters and say, you know, if you spend the money this way or if you partner with this group, it's going to ultimately be a more efficient process. And then on the advocate level, the advocacy level, we realize the system's broken, the, the whole the whole thing really on the federal levels. Um, not working. And I think what, from what I've experienced, a lot of the time it's people just thinking, this is how we've always done things. Why fix it if it's not broke? Well, it is broke. And so if it's broke, we have, I think a mandate, all of us to be creative and think outside of the box to figure out other ways that we can support survivors after disasters, because clearly what's been done in the past leads to a Benick family. Um, and if you're curious, I will send this out after, but Zach was just um, interviewed with, or by, I guess, former President Clinton um, through the Clinton Foundation. We have a really good relationship with the Clinton Foundation. Um, he, Bill Clinton came out, um, I don't know, a two year on the two year anniversary of Sandy to Rockaway. Um, and that was super cool. But so he has this interview he just did on Tuesday with um, former President Clinton and the CEO of Enterprise the Enterprise Foundation, although I'm butchering the name of the foundation, but um, so the three of them have a really good conversation and I'll send that out to anybody who's, who's interested. So let me get moving here. Okay, so I'm going to try to show this video. I'm really hopeful that it's going to play, but if you can't hear it or you can't see it, please tell me because I am not great at technology and I, I don't really know that this is going to work, but we'll try. Oh gosh. Okay, can you hear it? Anybody? We can hear. Okay, yeah. yay, You're thank doing you. great. Everybody <laughs> stay <you>. calm. <laughs> stay calm. We got we got this. All right, let me play. was destroyed. Everybody grew up in that house. All my sisters and brothers, my three children, and my grandchildren. St. Bernard just started rebuilding it. It gives me a lot of hope. Six months after Katrina, we wanted to pitch in and help out. We started building houses, the two of us. And people just started coming. It was so incredible. They volunteered, they donated, and that kicked off SVP. It was really an adventure, learning how to do construction. I have family who've lost homes and have never come back from Katrina. We're here to get the city back to what it once was. We had our first AmeriCorps team work with us soon after we opened up. We thought with more staff and more volunteers and more AmeriCorps members and money, we would be able to see more families come home. And the exact opposite was happening. The results were getting worse. 
And we knew we needed to work smarter, we just didn't know how. To do that, we had to change, and we were really fortunate to have met Toyota at that point. Over the last 70 years, Toyota's been developing how to create the best production system possible. If we do something well, we want to share. We want to give it back to the community. How many times I've heard, oh, well, that really doesn't apply here. The whole thinking behind the Toyota production system is continuous improvement. And how do we improve the process? We want to get everybody back home. In Toyota, if the shop floor line stops, there's a problem. You can see it very quickly. In this kind of setting, across the whole city of New Orleans, it's not so simple to see. Before Toyota came in, we had a lot of information about our different clients' homes, but a lot of it was sort of tucked away and hidden in computers. When you have a whiteboard system that's set up, it's easy for anybody to use, it's easy for anybody to read and track all the different projects and whether they're ahead or behind. We were the good guys, right? We were successful. We had built more houses than anyone else. We didn't talk about problems. By eliminating problems, we're getting incrementally better. We fix little things all day long, and the collective of all those little things helps overall performance significantly. People said there weren't enough ladders. We named all of our ladders, so that way we know, all right, we do have two extension ladders, we don't have to go buy another two. Some of them we give like human names, like Morty, Tuesday. Emily. Sir step a lot. Ladersaurus Rex. <laughs> yeah. It was taking us 116 days to build houses before Toyota, and after it was 61 days. We reduced construction time almost by half. So, you know, that's a, that's a big difference. Once you're liberated and you can actually talk about what's not working, and there's a tried and true process to fixing it, then you can really think big. So you look at Toyota's team. If you do it well, share it. We've worked in four different states, training other organizations. We can change disaster recovery in America. see that in metrics. This is how it should be. This is people enjoying their life. I love it. And what we do is help people get back to just being normal and living their lives. Thank you for watching that, everybody. I don't know if anybody has a Toyota out there. I don't, but I will say after partnering with them for as long as we have, I've, I've considered, you know, purchasing one because they're, they've been amazing. They've been incredible partners um, sharing. We were the first nonprofit that they shared the production system with. Um, and now we've gone out and shared it with other nonprofits, but it's made um, a whole different department within Toyota where they also share it with different um, nonprofits. So very cool. I should also have said that this is a pretty, not old, but it's from maybe a few years ago. Um, so some of that, you know, we've done thousands of homes at this point across the whole US um, and Bahamas and Puerto Rico included. And so at this the point, the video was made, we, we didn't obviously have that. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna jump into it, but there's a, one question in the chat um, what year do we implement the system? Ooh, I want to say, I don't know if Liz is on the call here. She would know, but um, I want to say it was before 2011. I want like end 20, 2009, 2010, I think. But Lori, I can find that out for you. I'm not sure. It's a good question though. Okay. I was just wondering, and I'm just also wondering for the other partners on the call, how many are, and is anybody else using the system? Oh, that's a good question. Anybody, anybody heard of the Toyota production system? I mean, I had a call with Elizabeth yesterday and it's literally the first time I've heard of it. Granted, I'm new to nonprofit and disaster, but 
I am curious about who else is using this system. If they're educating other nonprofits and you guys are, who's actually integrated this into their um, construction efforts? Yeah, good question. Group, any feedback? <laughs> I mean, we're not we're using building it together. To that's as we, go uh, ahead, Lee. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I see we're not using the system, but we 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 try to continually improve whenever we see we're doing something wrong. But it's um, if if we could do it on a larger larger scope, it would be wonderful. It's just we can't get to that point yet. Lee, who do you work with? Uh, Catholic Charities and oh, okay. So we are yeah. right down in the in at ground zero. And along with Laplace in that area, but um, it's um, you know it's it's a tough process because you've got to have the suppliers that are pro providing the service. You know what I mean? You can't do it all by yourself, so you have to have people help. Sorry, trying to go to the next slide. Um, yeah, Lee, just to your point about the suppliers, I think there's a, there's a lot of content in the in TPS about. <clears throat> like understanding what, what's within your control and what's not within your control and then building in kind of like time for things out of your control. So that if something um, like with a supplier, I know, I know the supply chain right now, everything is crazy, but how much can you control to then not rely on the suppliers or buy in bulk and avoid that? So there's a lot of like, you know, they, they address that, I think, frequently. But yeah, that's a good one. Um, and it's, it, it also, what I really like, I'm a very visual person. And <clears throat> I didn't say it, but my background has nothing to do with disaster recovery. Um, whatever, I'll share. I know all of you. My background is actually with wild horses out in the West, um, in California and New Mexico. And so there's obviously not a lot of them here. But um, I didn't know anything about a lot of this. I, I have like taken classes and courses since starting in disaster recovery, but um, it's so helpful to see everything visualized on the whiteboards. I know Olivia as like an, a previous AmeriCorps member, I'm sure you were interacting with them every day, but if a client's home is supposed to be done on April 15th and on April 17th, it's still not done. You see that right on your whiteboard and you put a big red dot magnet on it to show that it's behind and then <clears throat> you surface that and everybody collectively stops and comes together and talks about why is it behind? Why is it two days past the due date and it's not done? And then, you know, you, you move ahead, you get that project done when it's done. Maybe it's weather related or whatever, but continuous improvement makes us have those maybe uncomfortable conversations. So then we fix it for the next time. So, and then I'm, I don't even have this built into it, but if you guys are really interested in TPS, I can probably get like a whole module set up just about TPS. There's a few people on our team who've gone through the like official training. I haven't, um, but you know, I could do that. So if that's something that we're interested in, I can add it to our like training curriculum, but yeah. So that's the lens through everything. All of the construction work that we're gonna talk about the resilient building, client services will do today, fundraising, everything goes through this continuous improvement lens of surfacing problems um, and constructive discontent, basically. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so I'm gonna just get into it here. Um, like I said, there's gonna be a natural break between sessions or sections, I guess. Um, and so if you have questions, just hang on for a minute and then we'll get to those breaks and we can chat. Um, but I, the first and foremost, I wanted to talk about racial equity in disaster recovery. Um, I think we all in our respective communities have probably seen this come up in different, a different way or another, but generally communities that are hardest hit are world, already vulnerable for a myriad of reasons prior to the disaster. There's, I mean, I have it listed here, but redlining, predatory lending. Um, I know, for example, in New York City, maybe you don't know this, but 25% of all New York City homeowners actually live in a high risk flood zone. Most, I mean, a lot of New York is coastal and below sea level, um, which is really scary. And I live in one of those or lived in one of those areas. Um, and 60% of all of the people who live in those, of the, that 25% are very low or low income. 
So 60% of all, 25% of all New York City, which is a huge number, um, are low income and all, are placed in either affordable housing or just by generational um, placement in these flood, flood zones. Um, and what they'll end up doing is they can't afford flood insurance. If they can afford flood insurance, they, they base it around what their budget can allow for versus what pro, um, appropriate and proper coverage would be. And so then they're uninsured or very much underinsured. And this is just my example for New York. All my examples are going to be from New York, but that's across the country. That's not just here. Um, and so they were already at risk and now a storm hits and they either can't preserve their home, they have to be relocated, um, or they just aren't able to rebuild. Um, and then they're losing and decreasing that equity in their land and their home. And then that continues this um, you know, racial inequity that, that we all see, I think, across the country. A lot of the times there, there may be resources available to people, but they can't actually access them because they don't know that they're there. Or if they do know they're there, the agencies themselves are under-resourced and so they don't have the full capacity to support people. Um, I know, for example, in Western Kentucky where I was last week or two weeks ago, um, there's not enough translation services for resettled refugee populations. One of the towns that was hit hardest um, the tornado went like straight through the refugee resettlement area and there they speak like I think it's like 50 languages in that community and I'm <clears throat> not exaggerating and they don't have enough translation services for all those different languages so now those folks um, whether they owned or were renting don't don't know what they have access to so um, to this end and to I mean across the board what I'm what I'm trying to really like hone in on here is identifying our most vulnerable disaster survivors. We all collectively can't help everybody, but we can be serving the most vulnerable of you know, the community. Um, and I think within that, not serving people on a case by case basis, or not serving people, sorry, on a first come first serve basis. Because of course, like after a response, and I'm not talking response, I'm really only talking long-term recovery. After response, we vet clients, maybe we don't vet clients, we just are trying to get mucking and gutting done and people into a safe space. Um, so not so much response, but in recovery, we can't serve everybody. First come, first serve is not the appropriate and like proper way to be serving our community when really our like highly vulnerable populations need to be served first. And so throughout this like whole presentation, I'm gonna talk about um, identifying most vulnerable, going through our eligibility criteria for it. And then at the end, I'll ask you guys, you all have your respective like, you know, client cues. Um, some of your cues may be funded, some not completely funded, and we'll get to that in later modules. But go through those, the client queue that you have, your client list, um, in the next like 72 hours and reprioritize, like look at everybody's vulnerability put your top like 10 or 15 most vulnerable clients together and then go through it again and see, okay, actually our three to five top most vulnerable clients are, you know, X, Y, and Z families. And those are the three families that should be immediately going into the queue um, for, for construction. So I'll get like to it, but um, at the core, this, this, is, this is a big piece of why it's so important to determine vulnerability status. Okay, so the agenda is actually, the content here is um, into these like kind of four sections, our eligibility criteria application, scope and estimate walkthrough, which I don't talk a ton about because there is the construction module, um, determining eligibility, or determine, I should say vulnerability, sorry, approvals, denials, and then close out. Okay, so quick break, I wanna keep everybody awake. Um, any questions, thoughts, feedback so far? Any chat, chatter here happening? What, nope, nothing in the chat yet. Um, anybody wanna share anything? Olivia, you had something you wanted to share before, but I don't know if the moment's passed. I was just saying uh, that because of the pandemic, we took the whiteboard model and put it online 
to like a digital whiteboard that's like a shared um, spreadsheet, essentially a Google sheet uh, that with like, you know, a lot of people still work from home and like when the wait, like, you know, if we get another surge and stuff like that, um, that's super helpful. Uh, and here at Rebuilding Together, we do kind of a hybrid version of what SPP did. Cool, yeah, thank you. And that, that's a good point. I mean, the, the whiteboards were fantastic when we had an office to all share, but now we don't. I mean, I don't, and I know some, other, some of you don't. Um, and so having the virtual model is super helpful. As long as everybody's like actually updating it, which when I think when it's not like in your face every day and you're walking past it, feeling that guilt of, ooh, I didn't update my chart, the chart today, you maybe don't update it as much because it's on your computer and it's kind of hidden. But I know walking past it every day, I had the good guilt of, I need to update this thing. So whatever that says about me, it says about me. <laughs> but um, I'll go into the eligibility criteria here. Okay. Angela, I was just going to say really quickly, we can, yeah. I agree with um, the lady who just spoke at Hope Disaster Recovery. We do a hybrid. So we have our whiteboard for the clients that we're still working on. Plus we put our, how much they're funded. And that also helps our accountant look at that board to see if we're going over budget, um, which is a good uh, correction that we need to make. But, and then we also use one of the whiteboards for our volunteers scheduling volunteers, when they're coming in, how many are coming in, where we're going to put them. So we don't use it. Um, we haven't fully integrated it, um, but we have used bits and pieces of it, and it's been extremely helpful. It, yeah, it's really helpful. I mean, it seems basic or simple or whatever you want to call it, but it's so helpful, especially with volunteers. Um, and then if you do have, I mean, I don't know if you guys have this, but if you have volunteers coming to the office for like an orientation or whatever before they go out to site and they see that the boards and the volunteer numbers um, and you can make it fun and like an interactive tool to talk about, then you're just sharing that information with even more people. So, I mean, I, I really love it. And I, I, lo I liked um, getting to make it like really just a fun piece that you interact with all the time and not, cause it, it can be seen as like a chore or a burden, I think, but it's not meant, to, it's meant to be useful and something to keep you on track. So cool, thank you, Sonia, for sharing. Um, and also hi, cause I don't think I saw you earlier, but okay. So I took this um, from our new spring 2022 applications and quick note, the two, possibly three grants are coming out tomorrow. I'm very, very proud to say. So those will all be coming out tomorrow. Um, and the eligibility criteria, everything's like mirroring each other. So what's here is gonna be there too. Um, trying to give you guys some, some tips. Um, but you know, generally the criteria that we follow, I think you mostly all follow the same criteria. It's HUD, it's all to HUD standards pretty much. I know that also some of you um, work together. Um, there's obviously Kathy Charities is here, Lee, thank you. Um, and some of you get cases referred from, from Catholic Charities or from in Texas, like Connective and Har Harvey Home Connect. Um, and so just we wanna make sure that when you are receiving cases referred to you, you just have to make sure that the cases still follow this criteria. Uh, like across the board, every client that we're supporting, we want to make sure that they are following this criteria. So just that little PSA out there. Um, so this is the, the basics here. Owning the damaged home, obviously. Um, don't own a second property. Lots of land. Um, we want to make sure that they don't own like a second lot or, you know, piece of land somewhere. Um, if they are in a, like a two unit home and they own the full home and say their only income is from this like rental unit, I think there's some gray area there but generally they should just own the one property. Um, of course, owning it and living in it before the date of the disaster. Um, income below 120% AMI, that's subject to change depending on the grants. And I mean, you all have your own, I think criteria that even might be more strict than that at 80%, but generally it's 120% or below. Um, a big one here is do not have the financial resources to repair the home. And so that's really where we get into the um, document collection. And that can be so stressful for some, for some clients. I'll go between clients and homeowners, but um, clients, 
have experienced some level of trauma generally, although I'm not a social worker and able to prescribe that or, you know, really say that. But if we look at everybody through the lens of possibly having experienced trauma, and we take this really empathetic and um, trauma-informed approach to working with our clients, then building that relationship and that rapport helps us procure all of these documents. So we're going to need, you know, savings account information. We want their FEMA letter or, you know, an ineligibility letter from FEMA. We want to make sure that we're seeing their taxes, um, any savings account, their ID, the deed, all of this stuff. And it's a lot to put together. And I know I've done it plenty of times, but it's not, it's not just the documents that you're collecting. It's this building of a relationship with them over that you know two or three week period, even month sometimes, and and meeting them where they're at. If you're working with obviously an 85 year old senior who lives alone in her home, she's not going to be able to email or like Adobe scan something to you. Somebody's going to have to go out there and like help her through that. Um, and we take this like we call it the mom rule, but I mean really it's just treat clients as you would want your family members to be treated. If your grandmother or grandfather were in that situation and they needed the support, wouldn't, wouldn't you want somebody who would go out there and meet with them and say, okay, Ms. Smith, like these are all the documents you need. And I've been in this position plenty of times, but they just will plop down a stack of paperwork or show you their filing cabinet and be like, have at it. Um, and just take the time to go through them to go through those documents with them makes makes all the difference because you know FEMA is not going to do that for their appeal process. A lot of other nonprofits aren't going to have the capacity or time to do it. But if we are the people to take the time and do it, that gets Ms. Smith recovered, um, whereas she wouldn't have been able to get that rebuild help before. So I know that it's a lot to collect, but it's really crucial that we take the time to go through this with them um, and and support them through the process. Um, just other two notes here. They should not live in a floodway. Um, difference between floodway and flood zone. I've always had a problem with that, so I wrote it down. Um, let's see here. Okay, floodplain is comprised of the floodway and the floodway fringe, where the like the floodway includes the channel and adjacent overbank areas to effectively convey the flood water waters. So like I'm thinking of low-lying creeks river, riverine flooding, like that's where the water is going to come through. Where flood zone is, you know, the federally designated area that hurricane level waters or 100 year floods um, could come into the community, but are less likely. So just something to, to note here, we don't want to be rebuilding in a floodway or flood um, plain, because those are areas that are very likely to flood. So funding should just go towards repairs of sustainable long-term housing for folks. And I also, I added the um, portal search on here. You can just type in literally any address in the country and it'll tell you their like flood zone status. Um, and then either maintain flood insurance and or be able to possibly elevate their home to meet base flood elevation. This is a, this is a tricky one and it, it's, I think, pretty nuanced, but um, it's really, imperative that we are encouraging like long-term sustainability of the homes that we repair. And what I mean by that is we can't, I, I don't think that we can require people to get um, flood insurance, but we can walk them, like walk with them through the path to, to get to flood insurance. And so maybe that means being on the phone with the flood insurance company um, or, or, you know, NFIP or whoever they're insured with and getting the flood coverage added. Maybe they don't understand what they should be asking for. You already know their budget of what they can afford, but now you can translate, okay, this is their budget. This is the full coverage that they should have. Is there a payment plan that we could get them set up on so they get the full coverage? Are there other nonprofits? I know in New York City, there's a few other nonprofits that help um, prorate or, or work with homeowners to provide them with flood insurance at the level they need, but not at the cost that it would be, because um, the cost can be super prohibitive. So really doing as much as we can to get homeowners 
that extra layer of security. You all probably also know that if our homeowners receive any support or rebuild dollars from FEMA after a disaster, and then they don't get flood insurance uh, coverage, they are now going to be completely ineligible for any future federal funding. I'm sure you all know that, but I just feel like it's worth saying. Um, and that's really important because a lot of our homeowners don't know that and FEMA does not explain that very well. Um, and so they don't get flood insurance because they can't afford it or they don't really understand. Um, and then they're hit again and now they're ineligible for everything. Um, and it happens all over the country. I've seen it so many times in New York. Um, and then it becomes on us, the NGOs, the VOADs, LTRGs to basically rebuild for these families. Um, but if they had protected themselves in the first place, you know, they wouldn't need us. Maybe they still would, but the gap would be smaller. So let me just make sure I'm covering everything here. Um, another note that I wanted to make that's not on here too is duplication of benefits is really important that as we're going through eligibility criteria, we want to make sure that and I'm not saying that people do this, but it, it can happen, that they receive funding from their insurance companies or FEMA or SBA. SBA I know is a big one um, because it's a loan, but they don't use that money for the appropriate things that it was earmarked. Um, and so then we go in and we give them the same, more money for the same repairs. Um, and that's, that's a big duplication of benefits. In some situations that can actually put the homeowners at risk. Um, because if, you know, they're ever audited or insurance companies come out, agents come out to check on things and they don't have, you know, the receipts to prove where their own dollars were spent and then they see, you know, other work done, they, the homeowners could be liable to repay that back. So we just, we don't want to put anybody at risk. We want to make sure that if they've already received funds for a roof, that you would know exactly where that roofing money went. And if they had, you know, contractor fraud, they should be filing a police report. So then the police report can act as a receipt for, hey, we got, we got $10,000. We shouldn't have, but we gave it to our contractor up front. He scooted out of town and now we're without a roof and without $10,000. File a police report, that's your receipt. And now we're good. Like we can, we can go in and, and help that person. But there's got to be that um, that level of detail and I think like follow through with the dollars that they received. I also see the chat going a little wild. So let me see what is happening here. Okay, cool. We got some good questions. Okay. Lori, D Lori's asking, does SVP ever pay for the flood insurance for the first year? Oftentimes they have they have to pay up front at one time. Yeah, so we have had programs like that when we've gotten grants to be able to support homeowners for the first year. Overall, nationally, we don't have a grant big enough, although actually that is something that we're talking about, going to some of our bigger funders and saying, you know, nationally, can you support all of our homeowners for flood, with flood insurance for a year? I tend to think that there are already nonprofits that are doing a lot of this type of work, and how do we on a broader scale, like nationally connect to those groups so that we're not always having to front the money, I guess, but connect them every single time, every homeowner to those groups. So something we're talking about on a bigger scale, but it's a very good question. Rebuilding together, New Orleans, we'll do the first year on a case-by-case -case basis. SPP has done in the past. Yes, awesome, thank you, Olivia. Um, okay, Roy has a good question. How do you decide how much savings is sufficient to repair the home as long as it's less than the estimate to repair? How do you also show that someone doesn't have insurance affidavit? Yeah, we do a, we do a lot with the affidavits. Um, I say this all the time, but people who are gonna lie are gonna lie, right? Like, oh, I mean, we've all probably been there. There are gonna be clients that just like, are gonna mislead us, whatever. That's just human nature, unfortunately. But I think we can do as much of our due diligence as possible. And by getting stuff notarized and getting affidavits for things, we're at least covering ourselves. Um, how much savings is sufficient to repair the home? Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, it's basically, you have the scope, you know generally what work you're gonna do. If the gap is obviously like, you know, $5,000 and they have 
$50,000 in their checking account, which would be ridiculous, but they, they clearly can afford it. Also something that SBP really focuses on is people shouldn't have to spend their life savings and like retirement accounts to repair their homes. They didn't ask for the disaster to happen to them and they shouldn't have to wipe out their savings account you know, to repair their homes. So the savings part um, and their assets, that gets a little bit more gray, but generally if it's not like a crazy amount of money, then we want to make sure that the cost to repair is the ratio is correct to the cost that they have in savings or the amount they have in savings, if that makes sense. Um, do I require a FEMA? Do we require a FEMA denial letter? We require a FEMA like award letter. We need to see something from FEMA that shows what their award was. Um, and if they were denied, we wanna know why they were denied. Also a trick with the FEMA letters, if you're having trouble figuring out primary residents or you know, permanent residents, their FEMA letter, the address that they have on the FEMA letter is always gonna be the primary address. Um, and so it's like a good kind of like cheap way to, to see that. Um, Cause obviously FEMA is gonna have done their due diligence to confirm that. But um, we wanna see the denial letter, which now, FEMA is moving away from calling things denied or deny, a denial. We're using ineligibility, just fun fact. Um, so so um, they have an ineligibility letter and we wanna see the reasons why they were denied. If they say, I never applied to FEMA, then I mean, we can confirm that within our own like circles and you know, we can get that information um, or we can have them call FEMA and confirm they were never they never applied or registered. Um, and then affidavit. Yeah, affidavit for anything. Um, okay, so thanks. asking, sorry, go ahead, Roy. I was just saying, thanks. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, more documentation. I have another slide. I'm gonna go over it a little bit more in depth for all of the documents, but I also am gonna share with everybody after the call, um, the actual full list of the documents that we require. I was going back and forth between how much information to give you here and just to provide you in, you know, resources and materials. And I think it's going to be easier for you to just see it, you know, on one pagers and stuff that I send you. So here I'm just kind of going over the concepts and why we we require these things and how we can prove them. But then I'll send you all the documents too. So Rachel's got a question: How do we verify things like homeowner intent to maintain flood insurance? Um, I mean, it's hard. You can say you're going to call them every year. We've had programs and grants where we actually had to call homeowners every year and confirm they were still living in the home. That was not fun, um, calling people back three years later. We have to do it for 10 years. We're somewhere in the middle of that now. It's, it was a New York grant through the state. Um, but so there's always, you know, yearly phone calls. Um, but that's really, I would think, the only way. Um, Olivia's got cross-checking bank statements to see if there's been a FEMA deposit. Yep, that's helpful. Olivia was a client services coordinator with SBP very recently and lived all of this. So very much appreciate her help and guidance here. Um, how long does the entire process generally take? So thinking about building a queue efficiently in a timely manner. Olivia, do you remember the amount of, what was it, two weeks, I think? It's two weeks from first initial contact to approved. I feel like it's two weeks. Um, and then this, the walkthrough, sorry, go ahead. Is this like IDA response yeah. or general yeah. grants? You, you can use IDA as, a, as an example. Uh -huh. I think that's fine. I found that like the response set part would go much faster. So you can kind of um, set your own timeline. So at one point we were getting so many people um, and you have to collect all these documents that we were saying like, okay, you have two weeks, you have 14 days to submit documents. And then we're gonna like go to the next kind of batch of people that are in our queue. Um, so you can set it up how you want to. I think the longest thing that was in our way when I was at SPP was the writing the work scopes because we had a very finite amount of construction time. Um, but you can kind of build it out for all the other grants. It was like two years. 
three, but New Orleans specifically had a lot of um, really challenging things that set us back like within our permitting department, um, with the New Orleans permitting office and, and things like that. So I'm not sure if that would affect uh, that time that would reflect everyone. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and I think to, I mean, Rachel, to your point and to kind of how TPS goes through things, we want to, we do want to assign due dates, not out of response moment and into recovery. We want to assign due dates. I think what feels comfortable for you, as long as it's relatively aggressive and realistic um, of a timeline, that's what we're really shooting for. So I remember doing it in New York. The goal was 14 days. Um, and that's from first contact to basically approved application. We also did basically full and complete application approved before we sent out um, one of our construction staff members. And I know that's kind of, I don't wanna say debatable or like a hot topic, but um, people do that differently because there's the whole idea of not wanting to waste your client's time or overcommit or like have them put in all of these documents just to have them be denied. And then, um, you know, maybe that leaves them with a bad taste or whatever. But on the flip side, you may be having your construction team or, you know, project manager walk all of these houses that are not gonna be approved. And that's also an internally, what we call MUDA, which means waste. Um, it's a Toyota term, but we wanna try to eliminate as much waste from our uh, waste, including like time and resources and money as possible. So. We go, we take the approach of full client um, approved application, construction staff member, project manager, whoever goes out to the home, does the scope and estimate, sees what the cost is gonna be. And then that whole picture is what we just use to determine vulnerability and then um, approve or denial. So I'm gonna keep going though, cause we're actually, I don't know how I'm doing this so slowly, but Again, if you guys need to jump off, that's fine. I'm recording it and I'll keep talking to myself if there's nobody else here and then just send this out to you. But um, totally understand if you need to go. So just to get into the paperwork a little bit, just because we've been talking about it a bit, but I wanna outline it here and I'll send it to you after. Um, right, for own ownership, it's ID, deed, FEMA letter, title search, building search. We can do a lot of that on our own. I know Sonia, we were just talking about how sometimes it's just easier to do as much on your own as you can to avoid asking the client for some of this. Um, so as much as you can find that's public information, I encourage that. Um, owned, lived in the home before the disaster, that's gonna be your utility statements, tax statements, um, mortgage statements, three months. We always say three months of these things to show um, continuity, but also sustainability, because we wanna make sure that, like I mentioned, they can stay and live in the home for generally a few years, like three to five years is, is a comfortable amount of time um, because we're not just fixing the homes for the, the benefit of the home um, and for the, the market, we're fixing it for these homeowners that lived there and were impacted. So by showing sustainability that they are able to maintain the home, we're able to um, you know, provide that. Income we talked about, that's gonna be similar taxes, social security, pension letter, um, or social security letter and pension, um, and then asset review. Um, find, do they have financial resources to repair the home? Roy had asked about that earlier. That's gonna be your SBA loan. If they received a loan, have they been paying it? Are they up to date on their mortgage on, and their property taxes? Are they way behind on their property taxes and utilities? I've seen people $40,000 back in, or owing $40,000 in property taxes. And it was like mind blowing. Um, and so they were obviously not sustainable. I don't, I could not understand how they were able to stay in the house, but checking into things like that. And then the tip I have in the corner is one of our values, one of our core values is being a curious connector. It's like a little um, curious George kind of graphic, but asking the five whys to really like get to the core of some of this stuff. People I don't think are malicious or manipulative on purpose, but they might just not understand that they need to tell you what they need to tell you and um, explain to you. And so it's really our job to be detectives and our caseworkers to be detectives and like dig into all of this stuff. 
um, just really important that we have all the answers here and the, the big picture. And then, of course, like I said, people are going to lie, they're going to lie, but at least we, we can cover ourselves. Um, not live in a floodway that I, I talked about that. Um, the FEMA portal is going to be a good way to, to assess that. And then there's maintaining flood insurance we talked about pretty excessively. Um, and so determining flood risk is important there, just knowing, knowing where they live and the level of, um, I guess, risk that, that we assume by rebuilding their homes. Okay, so I'll take a quick break for a second, see what's going on in the chat, and then we'll go through construction. I know that it seems like we have not covered a lot, but we, we don't have, we probably are about 60% of the way through here. Very helpful. Gathering the info is a two week process. Yeah, generally about two weeks, Rachel. Sorry, I misunderstood. No, you're good, Olivia. Um, cool. All right, cool. I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so walk through. Again, this is where Toyota really <laughs> comes into play with things. We wanna always be assigning timelines and due dates. Every phase of the process needs to be active for a parking lot. Um, parking lots will be, so for instance, you know, the initial communication that's collecting initial content, sending the application out, telling them about the process, setting expectations. And then maybe the parking lot is seven to 14 business days of waiting for them to send you back everything. Or, or even that can be kind of active where you're going out to the home yourself to help them collect documents for, for two weeks. Um, but it's a parking lot and that it's it's waiting for something to happen. But then the majority of the, the process, this like visual um, whiteboard process that is TBS is active. And so when we have a walkthrough, it should be, we should be telling um, our team, we need to have that scope back within seven days. I would say seven days because Again, ideally, this is a construction team member who's on your staff and is totally unbiased, not a GC that you would use to potentially bid out the project, um, but just somebody who's knowledgeable in construction, possibly a staff member or somebody that you work with on your board or um, whoever. But the, the whole idea of them being just unbiased is gonna, is gonna be really important here. They should be putting together the scope of the work that's needed on the home. I don't remember, I was talking to somebody about it recently, but when you go with volunteers into a home, they love demo, they love demo, but they we don't love the costs of drywall, insulation, um, framing. And so as much as they love demo, the costs are a bit much, and especially right now. Um, and if they go and demo up to the ceiling, when really they only needed to demo two or three feet up, now your cost just doubled and it didn't need to. And so it's so important that when you have your construction knowledgeable person, um, they can say, oh, this only needs to be cut up four feet um, from the floor. And we're not gonna redo that kitchen because the kitchen is, is fine and clean and livable, even though you know, maybe it's old or out of date, but it's clean, it's sanitary, but we'll, we'll do the flooring. So. They walk in, they create that scope that says we're just going to do the flooring and four feet up on, you know, the, the walls and the dining room and living room. That's it. Because, I mean, you put a sub into a house where things are old or, um, you know, not up to date or whatever. It's like a field day for them sometimes. And I'm not saying that about all subs. Some of them really like get what we're doing, but some of them don't. Um, or they try to be sneaky, and if there's nobody there with them, they'll they'll say, "Oh, you need a new kitchen. The kitchen's old, whatever." And it's like, no. So that's why um, it's so important to have an unbiased, unattached, um, I guess, construction person go in there and and create your scope. Um, and that creation of the scope is what I'm calling the walkthrough, and that really should only be seven days, right? Because they go to the house, they write the scope. I don't know how much longer they need, um, and then. The next portion of that is the creation of the scope and estimate. So now they've written up their scope. They bring out contractors. Generally, you know, we've all talked about this. We, we require and recommend two contractor bids to every house. 
I know in some of your areas that's like impossible. And so we, 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 can, we talk about it, but generally we want two bids for everything. So you know you're getting the best price um, and that the scope is what you want it to be within a price that you can manage. Um, Caseworkers should be explaining all of this to the homeowner and setting expectations so that the homeowner doesn't hear nothing and then think, oh, I'm going to get my whole kitchen redone, flooring, you know, floor to ceiling, drywall redone too. The, the constant communication going through one funnel at your organization, one person, one caseworker is really important and helps reduce that level of trauma that so many survivors go through when they have to go to six different agencies and talk to six different people, um, it's, it's overwhelming. So as much as we can all do our best to keep all communication for homeowners through one person, whoever that is on your team, I think that helps tremendously. And then they're the ones building the relationship too. Um, if they're talking to four different people, there's not that ability to create the relationship. I mean, sometimes, but not, not usually. Um, so let me make sure I covered everything with that one. Okay. Oh, also something I wanted to mention here, the um, payment to subs. I, I think you're all already aware of this and doing it, but I'll say it anyway. We tell our homeowners, and I do these recovery trainings for homeowners and survivors, that when you get your checks, obviously, don't give the full 100% of the check up front to your contractor. But also, I would argue, don't even give them the first 30% or 50% until that work is actually done. Um, I know, and we all kind of are all over the country, and we are all in different kind of places of the, experiencing this, but it's really important. Even if it's a sub that we know are really close with, we trust them, wait until like 30 or 50% of the work is done. Go out and take a look at it. Have your construction knowledgeable person ensure quality control, and then you can pay them. And the quality control piece, you can only control once you still, when you still have that check, obviously. Um, and we recommend like mom ruling it again. So would you, when your construction person is walking it, would you want your own family member to live in a house with that level of quality? And that's like the lens that we're always thinking of things. How would you want your grandmothers communicated with? How would you want your home to look when it's done? That's like how we should be framing everything. So let me go on to the next one. Okay, and so this is a, this is a big one. Um, I probably am most passionate about contractor fraud and just general like scope and estimate and what we can and can't do. Cause I, I think I've experienced some level of like emotional abuse from many New York City clients over the years. Um, but compassion fatigue is a real thing that we all go through. And I have said that my own experiences have been a total coin toss of how the client is gonna understand things and feel about everything, but maybe that's just me being in New York City, who knows? Um, but what I have learned from all of that is it's so important to set expectations up front. And now I, I've got that and I can explain this to people before we even do anything. But as sub-grantees and as partners, we really are only covering life and safety repairs. So safe, sanitary, secure homes, which does not include backsplashes, countertops, like countertops should be laminate. I know nobody's doing a granite countertop, but there are, there are levels of countertops that are more expensive. And so everything really needs to be mid-grade. Like we don't wanna give people the worst because that's not fair. Um, but we also don't need to give them the most expensive things on the market. The market's crazy and expensive enough. Like, let's keep this reasonable. Dish dishwashers, we don't do. Microwaves, we don't do. Elevations, home elevations, I, we don't generally fund. Um, and teardowns and rebuilds. We don't do new construction unless it's like our affordable housing program, which is totally separate than what we all do. We can do demo, mold remediation, of course electric plumbing, the basic like rough in for electric plumbing carpentry, just to get it back to a livable place. And if your city state requires you to bring everything up to code and get like city state inspections out, then like, of course, you're going you're gonna to have to do that. But generally, we want to be just doing life and safety stuff. I also have my own experiences about decor options, which I didn't make a note of on here. But 
my experience is do not give homeowners any decor options, which sounds terrible, but I stand by it. Um, <laughs> any decor options that I've ever given homeowners and that I know across SVP we've tried to implement, it, it's not gone well. Um, you give people like two different options of things and inevitably somewhere along the way that can be messy. Um, and so we do, all the paint is white. The flooring is generally like the either vinyl or in some places we do ceramic, but not, not everywhere. Um, it just depends on cost. Um, vinyl or laminate for flooring, for like wood laminate or vinyl um, tiles or ceramic, depending on whatever, um, like what if it's a wet space or not. But really important, especially in today's like market with construction costs being what they are, that if we can order things in bulk and we can like, you know, go to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy a ton of stuff and we have the warehouse space for it, then that's going to significantly cut our costs and lead to your point earlier, like the timing it takes to order some of this stuff is insane, like totally insane. So how do we mitigate that? We, we don't order things we, or we bulk order things and then we only give homeowner, homeowners those things, no options. So that is why I stand by my no decor choices. Um, but it's really important that we're explaining all of this to homeowners from the beginning so they don't feel like we're just coming in and like imposing on them um, our, our choices and our ideas. It's really just, we're trying to make your home safe and livable. We do mid-grade quality um, uh, construction material. This is all we can offer. And if you're not comfortable with that, it's your home we respect that, but then that's, that's all we can offer you right now. No harm, no foul, we'll walk away or we won't do that piece. But um, I found that to be a helpful approach, so. Angela, I have a quick question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but- No, you're good, I'm at a good point so here. One of the things that you put that you cannot do is elevations, but then on a previous one, you said that they need to have flood insurance and agree to elevate their home if they can. So it's, is that what you mean by elevations? Because I was wondering about that in the previous slide, like that's a big undertaking when you're redoing a home to do an elevation, but I, I'm, I'm just confused about that. No, that's a really good point, Lori. I think I noticed it too. Um, and I don't, yeah, I, I did notice that. Um, so we don't, we as SBP um, have done elevations. We were the only nonprofit pilot program doing elevations in New York City. That program lasted six years and is for 10 houses. Um, and it's still wrapping up and that's, it took six years to do that. And that was just New York City. I know that in Louisiana and I think in Houston, although I'm not hundred um, percent, it's totally different market than elevating homes in middle of Queens and Brooklyn. Um, and it is able to happen where we can elevate the homes like internally um, because permitting is totally different. So there is moments where we are elevating them ourselves, um, but generally, for the the first earlier slide where I have you know flood insurance or base flood elevation or elevating to base flood elevation, I think the really important thing there is just sustainability and making sure that we're not rebuilding in a space that is a, a, like a floodway and then that they're protecting our, the asset basically. They're getting their flood insurance. We're helping walk them through that process. If they are going to be in, in some other elevation program or you know, have that ability with their state, with the state, um, then we want to support that. But, um, and then maybe they would need a, like significantly decreased flood insurance policy. But I think it's just the general idea of having them not be rebuilt in a floodway and then protecting the asset that we just all put funding into. And then separately, I know SBP does do elevate, ele elevation services, but that's a good question. And I probably need to get more information on that. Okay. Oh, thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just, no, no, it's okay. I was confused about it. Okay. Thanks. No, you're good. I, none of, I don't feel like on the spot. I mean, I don't know all the answers to stuff, but I can, I can find it out. Um, okay. So now vulnerability and we're way over time, but um, okay. So health and safety and vulnerability assessments. So confirming storm damage. Um, like I mentioned, we have the application approved first walk through, scope an estimate done first. And then from there, we're able to say, okay, all of this together shows that they, they meet all of this criteria. And so the vulnerability criteria comes in when we're trying to assess 
prioritization, but these are also things that could end up possibly having someone be denied. So we'll get to that in a second, but, um, oops, I'm a little off track there. Um, yeah, so confirming that it was storm damage, not deferred maintenance, that if there's health issues, obviously, if there's people in home, people in the home with uh, disabilities or medical conditions, prioritizing them, level of damage if they're displaced um, or their, their displacement situation is really unhealthy, then we want to make sure that we show rent and mortgage and that that's not sustainable. So that's another um, vulnerability factor. And if they are living in the home and there's mold and leaking water, like my Benick family that I deeply care for, they were living in this home with so much mold, so much mold. Um, it was horrifying. I could like couldn't even go in there. And this is pre-COVID, had to have like all the masks on. Um, so all of that like factors into it. And then family composition, of course, like if there's children in the household or seniors, those are factors that come into play um, with determining vulnerability. Okay, so then you take all of that information and you put it all together and determine if this is a home you can work with. Again, if you're receiving this as a referral from another agency, you're gonna wanna do um, your own assessment or make sure that they know that you're, these are your guidelines and this is what the um, homeowners have to meet. So you're looking at everything and then determining it. Um, okay, so actually, let me go back to that really quick. So something I, I, I meant to mention is if you have, you know, a queue of 20 people who are approved, you've determined that they're vulnerable, um, but you don't have the funding for it, that is a fantastic um, mechanism for you to go and find additional funding. You know, of course, to SVP, but to other groups too, to city, state, your long-term recovery groups, your unmet needs roundtables, Oh, everybody, everybody and anybody should know that you have this queue of 20 people, here's their stories and the story piece and the like fundraising piece, we're gonna have one of our subject matter experts do in a few weeks, but um, it's so helpful to have that, like it's data, it's data, but it's data with names and stories and pictures. Um, and that's like, funders love that. I mean, obviously like for ourselves, we try to make it as easy for everybody as possible, but some of the applications I've applied for, they make you go above and beyond, but this is the general like story. And so it's really, it's helpful to have all of this information. So just something I felt like I needed to throw in there. Um, okay, and then why deny? So like, of course we can't serve everybody as much as we would love to, but there's lots of reasons we would deny somebody. I'm not gonna read all of them. Um, I think some of the main ones are sustainability, we really want to help people who are able to live in the home. Like I mentioned, we're not rebuilding the home, we're rebuilding um, the, the family's space. Um, unwilling partner or unresponsive partner is another reason that I've denied lots of clients. Um, we'll do literally everything possible, bend over backwards for people, call them a million times, email them, visit if we have to, or if it's appropriate. Um, but at some point, you just deny them. Um, and it should be a denial, not an on hold. If somebody, is, and I think maybe I have that or maybe I don't, but um, on hold denotes like um, some end to being on hold. That means either they told you, hey, I'm gonna be out sick or I'm gonna be in the hospital for two weeks, call me in two weeks, fine, you're on hold. Or um, you've been trying to get in touch with them and or sorry, or yeah, you've been trying to get in touch with them and you can't get a hold of them, you can like create a date or a calendar reminder for yourself in 30 days, I'm gonna reach out to them again. If I can't get them in 30 days, they're denied. But the hold category should be reserved for like an activity. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Damage is aesthetic or just deferred maintenance. There's a thin line between all of us being disaster uh, repair groups. Some of us are not only disaster repair, but um, between that and deferred maintenance, a lot of our grants are flexible and that they can help deferred maintenance if it's a safety factor, um, but some of them kind of aren't. And so there's like that is kind of a blurry area, but generally, of course, not anything that's aesthetic. Um, if it's out of your service area or if they have like um, 
they can afford a market rate contractor, we want to, of course, um, you know, deny that client because they can afford to do it on their own. Maybe they just need subcontractor refer recommendations and that's fine. Oh, I did, I did put this in, I wasn't sure if I kept it. Okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, the, the key here is that if they're on hold, it's, it's active. We want everything to be an active bucket, not just lots of parking lots. If somebody's on hold, I mean, we used to say, I think the on hold bucket was only available for 30 days. So either they told you I'm gonna be in the hospital for two weeks and you call them in two weeks, or you set a reminder for yourself for 30 days you try to get them as much as you can for 30 days. And then after that, they're denied. And that's not to say that once that time frame has passed and they call with like a super reasonable explanation of why they went and ghosted you, um, then you, you can put them back in the process. You can put them back into the queue, it's fine. And it's your discretion, but it's important that we don't have all these like lingering clients and cases like, cleaning that up and having everybody know the date that they have to call you back or you have a date that you're going to call them back helps just like have a clean kind of queue and everybody who's in your queue is active so that that helped me a lot um, keep everything kind of organized okay compelling client stories like from the very beginning here we saw that video um of, um, I don't remember what her name was, but the, the woman who we were serving a few years ago in New Orleans and the Benick family, I had a really good relationship with the Benick family and they were comfortable with me taking pictures and getting their story together. But that all is so important for, for funders, for funding. Um, and I know that's something that myself included, like we're all perpetually looking for more, more funding. Um, but having those, um, moments be as organic as possible, especially after somebody's gone through trauma is really important. Um, and a lot of the times I think people are open to it and want to share their story. Um, they just need to do it in a space that's like genuine and comfortable, I think. And we don't want to just like force this interview on them. And it's again, like totally up to your discretion. If you know that Ms. Smith is like ultra sensitive and really not going to be able to handle um, these questions, don't ask Ms. Smith, like ask Ms. Jones by all means, but it's important that we have these stories. I will say, Rachel, you do a fantastic job of like compiling all your stories really well. Um, and that's not to say everybody else doesn't do a fantastic job too, but I just was looking at one of Rachel's yesterday. So that's fresh on my mind. Um, but you, you all have sent me fantastic like before and after photos, or even sometimes it's just after photos and a photo of a client. And it's like, it helps so much. I can't tell you how much it helps when I'm going back to our funders to say, this is Miss Jones. This is the work that your money provided through this other organization. It's like, it, it speaks volumes. So, and you've all sent me pictures and stories and it's fantastic and super helpful, but you can use that for your own um, funding asks. So let me go on here, start file. So now you have the, the um, case approved. This is really just talking about that first, that final meeting with the homeowner before you get into um, construction. So time matters, being aggressive, having due dates for how long construction is gonna take, telling the homeowner, checking in with the homeowner, time matters. Um, and then all your con contracts and documents should be signed here with a copy given to the homeowner so they have everything for their records. Okay, let me pause. There's two questions. This is the last section. Cool. But oh, Lori and Olivia, thank you guys. Um, okay, close out and rework. So a little bit into the final portion of construction. Um, we're doing a final walkthrough, like I mentioned mom rule, make sure that your construction knowledgeable person goes out there and sees the final work. Generally, they should be with the homeowner and the homeowner should say they're comfortable with the work and then they're signing everything off. If there's a punch list or you know a few more things that need to be done, it's fine. But at the due date where you've assigned and said that, or the due date you've assigned that says this is when the home should be done, that's when the walkthrough should be happening. And then of course the gorgeous well-lit photos that you all already are taking. Um, 
Okay, rework and warranty period. I don't know that we've all talked about this before, but it's definitely something that's come up for our new application. But we want to make sure that our homeowners are protected um, for a year after we do this work. Could be volunteers, staff. Some of you have internal staff that do the work, which is amazing, um, or subs. But we want to make sure that they have a warranty to protect them, especially if it's like a roof um, or any foundation work. There should be at least we have a one year warranty. I would say that's like pretty standard um, to protect homeowners if, if something does go wrong. Okay, wrap up only, you know, what is it? 20, 30 minutes late here. So sorry about that. Um, but this is actually the finished picture of the same room in the Bennett home that I just took this past December. So four months ago, three months ago. Um, we were able to do the roof. It's a fortified roof now. All of the siding is brand new and I probably could have included that, but the interior where the um, light switch is kind of on where it would be on this side, but this is the same room. Um, so just, it took them nine years to get there, but um, I think I just wanted to like wrap it up and if we can do it for a family who waited nine years in New York City, we can do this anywhere. And I truly believe that we should not be taking nine years to do this. They were still doing work in Katri from Katrina before Ida, and that was 16 plus years since Katrina. Um, and I, I just, I really, really hope that what I'm sharing today um, helps you all be more efficient and you know supportive of disaster survivors in your area so that they don't have to wait as long as our homeowners have waited um, in your respective communities. So with that, I will just ask if there are questions. I'm way over. Um, I'll see if there's anything in the chat. Thank you, thank you. Yes, oh, very, very happy to be able to do this for you. You, you all know where to reach me too. Um, and I said it in the beginning, but please send me feedback if I missed something or you have a totally different experience. But I'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions or feedback or comments. Huge, thank you. I found this incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, just really appreciate this. And, and the people on the call as well with your tips in the chat, yeah. I really, really enjoy working with all of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's been great. I mean, especially because you all worked with Marley and I just thought the world of Marley. Um, so it was an intimidating group to come into because she's amazing but I've really gotten to enjoy working with everybody. So thank you for making my transition here so much better. Um, and I, I hope this, this is helpful. Any other comments, questions? I think it's been very helpful. It's nice to meet all of y'all face-to-face, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. I know there are faces here that I, have, I haven't met everybody, but it's nice to see everybody's face. Um, mm -hmm. All right, well, we're way over, so I will stop and um, uh, get the PowerPoint downloaded and sent to everybody. But yeah, just again, appreciate everybody's time. And it was great to see you all. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye Thanks, everybody. Angela. Angela, thank you. You did it. Thank you. Oh, my gosh, I'm trying to pause the recording.